So uh, this is Stiper. So it's a combined rant Stiper conference, and we've been working together to do that. So most of the people though have come through rant that for all the things, and it's been a lot of work. And Celia's done amazing work on that. I'm uh, affiliated with the Savory Institute as well as Holistic Management International um, as a trainer for both organisations. So um, I'm looking forward to introducing Mark up as the next speaker, so I'll keep to my time. Um, I went back and looked at all the different uh, definitions of regenerative agriculture and they tend to have a certain style. They'll start with the principles, so increases soil organic matter improves whole agroecosystems, <laughs> a lot of that sort of, you know, water cycle, all that sort of stuff. And then they talk about practices. This list of practices, so no-till or compost or silver pasture, that doesn't work for me at all. The list of practices, I think, is really um, sending us down the garden path, I'd argue that uh, because people can do things like no-till cropping uh, well or poorly. So, sorry, it, we've got to know what's actually happening on the land and what's the outcome. And I'm saying we need to shift from a practice-based definition to a function-based definition of regenerative agriculture. And I'll try and explain what I mean by that. So this is just out of the TerraGenesis website. So they have the principles, grow, evolve, design, you know, holistically, improve whole agroecosystems, and then the practices. So that's out of the um, TerraGenesis. This is out of the Chico, uh, California University. And it's very similar, sort of, they lots of words, um, and then sort of they go on to practices. Um, it, what worries me is that we need this to be measurable and auditable. We need to know that it actually is working. Because if we're going to demonstrate it to people, which I feel like that's what we're all here for today, is to actually start demonstrating all these, uh, all what regenerative agriculture is, then we need to be able to measure it and show that we're serious about it that we're serious about the money, we're serious about the impact on people, and we're serious about the impact on the land. I, I think it's going to be incredibly uplifting hearing what's coming up. I've spoken to the speakers and stuff, so it'll be incredibly uplifting of what's to come. So, you know, Charlie said a wonderful picture of where it is at the moment and the problems and the a glimpses of what we're going to be doing and talking about. So this will be really... Um, really positive couple of days. I think it would be fantastic. So this is my definition. I'm not saying it's the definition. I'm throwing it out there to be knocked around and argued and we can go backwards and forwards. But it's based on lots of farm visits. Um, you know, what do you see when you walk onto a farm that's actually uh, uh, using regenerative agriculture? What are the indicators? I'd like us all to know by the time we leave that if I walk onto a farm and see these things, I can go tick, tick, tick for that, for that land, people and profit. So, um, based on a lot of research, um, Stipe has done a lot of research in this area, so we've measured a lot of stuff. Um, and uh, for my sins, I've done that with Cole Sice. So, you know, we have walked and talked and landed on so many farms and driven so far doing all this research. And also that I, I'd like it to be auditable. I'd like it so an independent person could come onto any farm that's practising regenerative agriculture, measure it and say, yes, this is fantastic. At the moment, I find that's a little bit woolly. What do we mean? And sometimes uh, there was a... Uh, Josh Durrow, a CSIRO uh, researcher, he said he'll go onto one farm and they'll say, oh, I've been trained by Graham, it's going fantastically. And he'll go out there and there'll be birds and lizards and the grasses are fantastic. And then he'll come out of that farm, drive down and drive into another one and they'll say, I've been trained by Graham, it's going fantastically. And he goes out and it's a desert. So we need to break that problem that we think we're doing a good job to know we're doing a good job. And Peter and I will be talking about that later and Mark's also got a lot of evidence as well. Um, so 
I did this project with, this was another one that was a nightmare. There was 11 groups of you know, greening Australia and you know, it was just horrible. They wouldn't let me go and talk to farmers because they thought I was going to ruin all the grasslands. Um, you know, so it was really, thing. but what we did was we were doing, um, uh, we were doing uh, interviews of people, so structured interviews through Sydney University. And it was during a drought, and I was doing them around Wagga, and it was really um, devastating. You know, it wasn't going very well. And there was uh, young researchers that we were going out with. They came back traumatised. That evening, they needed debriefing. They were that traumatised. They had only ever gone and done their research on a farm. They'd never spoken to a farmer, and it devastated them. And the thing that really stuck with me was that there was a big difference between the people that were regenerating and the people that were doing the conventional and sort of was trying to feed their way through the drought. The people that were sort of their crops had failed and they were feeding the animals and doing all that, they would say to me, the best thing, Graham, is the kids don't want to be farmers. So I'm saying that Actively promoting agriculture to your family and others is a really crucial point. Are you that confident and enjoying it that much that you don't see it as child abuse? <laughs> I think it's really important that we get to that level, that it is the best thing that we can be doing. Another one that's measurable, so that one's a little bit hard to measure, but this one, and Mark will talk about this, so I, I won't talk about it, is we can actually measure farmer wellbeing, and Mark will present the whole, whole case for this, but I'm saying that we want high farmer wellbeing scores, and Mark will explain the theory and stuff out of this fantastic work that Mark and uh, Sue Ogilvy and others have done. So I'm saying for the people to put into that circle, I'm saying we want high well-being scores and if you were talking to them and you didn't want to interrogate them and get a well-being score, then are they actively promoting agriculture? So when I go on and they're going, oh, this is great, we're setting it up for the kids, da, 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 I go, that's going really well for them. So is that okay as, as an idea? So um, the other one, you know, that... that you know, regenerative ag as a practice, this is no till, but it's not what we're talking about. I go to so many farms that are saying I'm practicing grazing management or I'm really good at grazing management or I'm really good at cropping and no till and all that, and the place is a desert, like some of the people that I've trained and Josh Darrow was measuring. So I'm talking more about this. This is Gabe Brown's farm. Um, and so he, that is a different sort of no-till. They're completely different in my mind. This one restores soil health by having decomposing litter, which I'll talk a bit more about later. By having decomposing litter on the soil surface, you actually increase the nutrient cycling, the water infiltration and the stability or, or less erosion. So we need to know that they look different. So when I'm going on, I'm looking for this decomposing litter and this residue. I'm looking for active decomposition and I'd like it to be moderate decomposition because once you go to moderate decomposition, which so I'll define, David Tongway would define it as a visible fungal attack in the litter. So in really healthy bush or in a compost heap, if you pull it apart, you can see visible fungal attack. When you do that, all the measurements show that you massively jump up in the nutrient cycling. So we want to get to that level. So this is no-till comparisons from Gabe again. So this is organic and this is sort of the measurement done by uh, Rick Haney. Um, are you talking, where's Cole? I can't see him. Has he done a runner? Oh, there he is. Um, are you talking about Rick stuff at all? No? Okay, so Rick's sort of working on new ways of thinking about soil testing, and I really like it. It took, took me six months to work it out, but for Col and I to work it out, that it actually tells you, the soil test tells you what you need to, to do to the soil to make sure you get your cover crop back. 
So it's actually a different focus. It just doesn't say what's there. It's telling you how to do it, but it uses this water extractable organic carbon um, to sort of do that. So this is uh, organic, so lower numbers, lower this, no-till, low diversity, lower numbers, no-till, moderate diversity, so a few species, high synthetic fertiliser, not much difference. So I grouped them all in my head about the same. And then this is Gabe with no-till, high diversity, zero synthetic and livestock. So there's a step change once you go to that sort of level. So, but all of them would come under the regenerative ag, ag practice of no-till when they're completely different, completely different outcome that you get. Um, I'm going to propose, I'd like, well, I'd like to propose that we use uh, landscape functions. So this is work done by David Tongway and Norm Hindley for CSIRO. And they were tasked with going out and working out what's going to happen at the next rainfall. So um, what is it, landscape function? It's, it's about measuring the soil surface. I really like it because even real old people that are quite difficult to train and, um, <laughs> and sort of very opinionated can actually be taught this. So I like it sort of, I, I go, if, if there's two of those can learn it, then anyone can learn it. So, um, but this is what it is. So what they did was, if they wanted to know, is it going to be stable or erode? Is the water going to infiltrate or run off? Is the nutrients going to cycle or nothing's going to be happening in a dead soil? What are the indicators? So I've dropped out a few because it was a bit, <laughs> bit busy. But if you want it to be stable, it needs to be covered. I don't think anyone doesn't know that, sort of. But most farmers, I find, don't practice it. So they, can they kind of ignore it. So they know that it needs to be covered, but then they can't work out how to crop or do whatever they want to grow without that. So they ignore it, which must cause a lot of tension, I believe. There'd be a lot of cognitive dissonance there. The litter, the litter cover is really important for stability. And then for the next one, water infiltration. This is this, how much of each hectare is covered with the bases of perennial grass? This has a really big import. So I tend to be grass focused rather than, uh, and grazing focused rather than um, cropping. But with this, you just wouldn't have this basal cover of perennial grass. It would just, all the annuals would come in as litter on here. So they provide water infiltration. That has a massive impact on water infiltration. And the surface roughness. If you've got a rough surface, it acts as little ponds, little dams, and captures moisture. Where I came from in southwest Victoria, if we'd got, the surface got rough, we would actually go and plough it and make it smooth again because it wasn't, it wasn't fun to drive the motorbike or the ute over. So we would actually destroy the function sort of to make it nice to drive over. The other thing is this nutrient cycling. The perennial grasses drive the nutrient cycling. Massive amount of feeding the soil life capturing all that in the rhizosphere, competing, dragging, mycorrhizal fungi, all that stuff that we all talk about. But this is the really big one between the perennial grasses. You must have decomposing litter for nutrient cycling. It's the short-term carbon. There's sort of three types of carbon. There's the short-term decomposing litter. There's the sloughing off of the roots as you graze the perennial grasses. And then there's the liquid carbon pathway. So, you know, the Christine Jones story that sort of she was ahead of the science as usual. So she started talking about that sort of liquid carbon pathway before people ever knew about it. So we need to know this decomposition and again, surface roughness. So altogether, that's the relationship between the top five indicators, there is other indicators as well, and stability, water infiltration and nutrient cycle. I like it because it's measure, oops, sorry, it's measurable. Uh, you do a transect, you have to do sort of stuff. It, we find we can train farmers to do it, even coal. And, <laughs> and I'm proposing that we go from a practice based to a function based definition. And, and how does that sound? Does that make sense at all? Yeah, and it should be measurable. Everything's got to be measurable. So this is other work we did through that same project with Sydney University. If you increase landscape function, you increase soil pH, 
you increase phosphorus availability, you increase carbon and you increase nitrogen. There is no doubt, the work's being done, it's peer-reviewed, blue ribbon, double overhead foxtail science. I don't understand why it doesn't catch on. We've been talking about it for 15 years, but it's sort of, it's not liked. But yeah, you know, it always works. This is other work that Col and I did with, um, through Stiper, where we measured uh, landscape function on 13 farms in Victoria and New South Wales. This photo I've put in down here, this is where the treatment area was. That was the control out in the paddock. And the treatment area was on the edge of this gateway with bare soil. In two years, we took it back to chocolate cake within two years. So I'll be coming back to this idea of we need to be doing trials. We need to be working out what's going on. So this soil got better too because we were trying to get the farmers not to change their practice on the control paddock. This was incredibly rich. So we accidentally, all I did was just manage it for soil health and soil carbon. I didn't manage it for stocking rate. I ignored all of that and we accidentally grazed it at the district stocking rate. But that had nothing to do with the decisions I made. So within two years, we had it back to that. I've got others. So I'm saying that decomposing litter is the common link between perennial pasture and all the other cropping practices that, and, uh, and horticulture. All the, all the practices, decomposing litter is the common link or the, the uh, common denominator. Um, here's sort of decomposing litter. That was near Geelong. Uh, that was near our place. There was an area in a goat trap out at Cobar. It had decomposing litter. It was the only place, this was tens of thousands of hectares, it was the only place that I found perennial grasses was on this double hinged goat trap gate, which was normally closed and the, goat and the goats and the sheep couldn't get to it. Uh, this is George Taylor on his place and this is uh, on our place in southwest Victoria. I'm saying that decomposing litter is the regenerative ag common link. In cropping, this is sort of some of that uh, visible fungal attack. I'm saying it's also the same. This is Gabe's photo. You can see that there's decomposing litter where you can see it on there. I found it really hard, and this is from others. So as you go down through the soil surface, you'll find that there's uh, decomposing litter on it, so uh, the common link. So I'm saying for the land, um, I'm saying increasing landscape function and biodiversity, and we'll need to sort of discuss some measures for biodiversity. But I, I think that that's really solid stuff. So I see landscape function as the foundation of biodiversity. Most of the time when I'm talking to people, I feel like they're talking about, do I put sash windows or, or louvers in the house when they haven't built the foundation? So landscape function is, is the foundation of this. For profit, I'm going to not say very much again, but this is uh, for Mark, who's following me up. Um, and sort of, I'm saying the profits have got to be stable or increasing because that work that they have done found that they're equally, if not more profitable than the best farmers in New South Wales, these people that were practicing. So, but I don't want to steal Mark's thunder. So I'm saying overall, this could be a possible definition of regenerative agriculture. So people, high wellbeing scores, land, landscape function and biodiversity and profit stable or increasing. So that triple bottom line of how do we get all three going and how do we measure them and how do we keep that and Peter and I will be talking a little bit about that later. How's that? Is that alright? That's all I've got. So thank you.